Chapter 15, Facilitating Social Development. We know how important social development is in those early childhood years, and some children's disabilities or delays can obviously um, impact social development significantly. So what do we need to do? We need to teach children how to approach a social interaction. So how to go to your friends or your friends, um, the kids in your class and engage with them because many children um, who have autism or other um, developmental delays, just approaching another child is difficult for them. How to interact, we need to teach them how to um, engage with other children once they've made that initial approach. And then in an inclusive classroom, we also need to work with uh, typically developing children to think about how do we deal with children who are different than we are. Um, and that obviously goes both ways too. Um, and then how to manage conflict. So these are the things we're going to work on with our kids. Um, as we know, social skills are part of overall development. So when you are engaging with someone socially, you are conversing with them, you are looking at them, you're thinking about what's happening. All of these skills are needed in that social interaction. So we need to make sure that kids have these things because as they go through their life, they're going to need to be able to engage with other people, you know, in an appropriate way. So um, appropriate social skills are rules and expectations prescribed by particular groups as to how group members will conduct themselves in private and in public. So generally what we're talking about are the ways that we want to teach children to engage appropriately with other children, with adults, um, with teachers, right? So because those skills that they learn at school um, it, or in our care are things that are gonna translate to the rest of their world. Um, mostly for most kids in um, early childhood, it's going to be about getting along with other people, right? Um, typically functioning kids come in having a way of dealing with their families. And then we add on people outside your family. How do you, how do you work with them, right? So we need to give them opportunities to interact with others. Um, there are three main temperaments in children. So there are easy children, there are difficult children, and then there are slow to warm up children. So um, you can think about the children that you know, and they may or may not fit within these three types, right? So the ones easy children, you know, are, are easy. So you're not going to maybe need to spend as much time working through these things with them. Difficult children, it's going to be a little bit harder. And then your slow to warm up children are, um, they're going to be okay, but it's going to take them a little while, right? Difficult children are always going to be the ones who have the hardest time interacting with others in appropriate ways. Um, so this is an important point right here. Emotions are felt, but reactions to emotions are learned. The way you feel is important and it is the way you feel, but the way you react to those emotions is something that you think about, that you learn, that you see in the world around you, right? So the one of the best ways and the most um, powerful way that we teach children how to um, engage with others and how to have relationships with people around them is by modeling the behavior, right? So we need to show children what behavior we want to see. Some children can't make that link between the behavior that they're seeing and the behavior that they need to do, okay? So in those cases, that's when we need to teach children right? Really intentionally. Um, okay. So again, what we want to see is what we want to do. So we need to be responsive. We need to be responsive to young children's needs that will help them understand, that will help them feel safe. 
It will help them feel understood and valued, and it helps them be um, a person who is confident and comfortable in working with others. If you are not responding um, in a timely way or in an appropriate way, then that child becomes uncomfortable, worried, you know, wary of what's going on in the world. So um, children, babies who don't respond to typical, um, in the typical way with smiles, coos, or eye gazing often are not stimulated by the caregivers to express emotion. If your baby or the baby that you're caring for is not responding to you, you stop engaging that baby. So it's important that we remember that we need to, even if that child isn't engaging with you, we need to engage with that child, right? Overstimulated children turn, tend to withdraw and turn away from caregivers' show of emotion. Don't play it too hard, right? So you need to, as I've said, numerous times, you need to figure out how to work with the child. What works with child A is not always going to work with child B. And so your job is to figure out that child, right? Um, over responding children, they, they, can't, they can't stop it, right? And so sometimes those kids are the ones where you're like, ooh, stay away from that guy. He's a little too much, right? But your job is to figure out how can we work through this together? So there's a general sequence that children learn um, social skills or develop is probably a better word than learn. Um, and that is attachment. So first, the first social skill that a child will have as an infant is attachment. Mm -hmm. They'll know who their person is, right? They will respond to that person. And that happens because that person responds appropriately and positively to them. And then joint attention. And this is when a, a little baby catches your eye and directs you to something to look at together. Um, one of the things, and I let me see if we go. Nope. Um, joint gaze is when, or mutual gaze, is when you're both looking at each other. And that's the first step. When you have the attention of the child and the child has your attention. And then the next step is that child directs your attention to something else. And because they can't say, hey, look at that thing over there. They look at that thing. And because you've developed that mutual gaze where you're looking at each other, you know, oh, that baby wants me to look over there. And this is such a natural process. It's so crazy that kids are figure out, like little tiny babies, figure out how to communicate with you by looking over there, right? Separation protest is when you go away, they're not very happy about it, right? We've all been there. And then the next step is fear of strangers. So I'm maybe I've gotten over my um, separation anxiety, maybe not, but I don't want to be with people I don't know, right? So I'm fearful of them. And then it becomes a little bit more of an anxiety issue, not a fear. Like, I don't really want to be with you. I understand that this is a thing that happens though. And then theory of mind. This happens in toddlers and preschoolers. This is when kids figure out that other people have feelings too, and that other people do things. They're trying to figure out their motivations for things. Why is that person doing that? This is a really important part of social development. Um, when you can see outside yourself to know that other people have feelings and do things um, because of their own motivation. And then you try to figure out how that works. So like the whole sharing thing, you can't really have sharing until you have theory of mind, because if you don't get like that person has feelings too, right? Then there's no reason why you can't just grab something out of somebody's hand. So that's why theory of theory of mind happens in toddlers and preschoolers. And this is why sharing becomes a thing that they can do because they've developed this social skill and then pretending and role playing. So you don't see pretending so much until later preschool and then role playing and games with rules where there's a structure to play that happens when you get into older preschool. 
Um, we've talked many times, if you've taken classes with me before, about the the um, various stages of play. So unoccupied behavior, you're just not really doing anything. Um, on Onlooker behavior, you're watching to see what's going on, but you're not actually doing anything yet. Solitary play, I am playing with my own stuff and the world is going on around me. Parallel play, my friend and I are both playing. We're not actually playing together, but we're playing right? And then associative play. So this is, we're kind of playing together. Um, We're playing with the same things, but we haven't really defined how our play works together. And then cooperative play. Cooperative play is when you're playing games, when you both understand what's happening, what the rules are. Associative play is, um, toddlers can do it sometimes, Preschoolers can do it. Associative play is when you're going to have the most um, conflict because there's not a real structure yet. Everybody's trying to figure out how this, how we play together, right? By the time you get to cooperative play, then you know better. Most kids, and what happens is when there are conflicts in cooperative play, it's because one child doesn't understand the rules for play yet, right? And a lot of times you'll have a group of kids, you'll have one child who knows exactly how everyone is supposed to be playing, right? And if you're not playing that way, that will cause conflict with the person who's in charge um, or the person who doesn't understand how to how we're all playing together will get upset because they don't understand what's happening. So how do you teach children to play together? Well, you put them in situations where they have to be together, right? Um, you can help them into the play. So when you're talking about a child who has developmental delays, they might have a speech delay or they might have a cognitive delay. Um, you need to sometimes be their guide into how to play with other children. So you can say, oh, Jenny, I see that you're playing with blocks and um, Randy here wants would like to play with you too. Can we can we hold some blocks? And we're talking about giving them materials to stimulate play, placing objects in their hands, verbalizing their actions, rejoicing. Oh, you guys are doing a great job playing with blocks together. You're sharing, you're building together, and then helping others join in. So um, in, a, in a typical classroom where you have all typical children, you may not have any places where you need to do that. When you have children who have special needs in your classroom, you may feel that your job is to help that child enter play. Um, it's much better to be the person who helps that child enter play than to have a child who's just sitting there on the sidelines all the time and can't do it. Um, it's because they don't know how or they're not comfortable. And so your job is to facilitate that, to be a guide, to help them figure out how to play with other children. Um, and then slowly removing yourself, right? Sometimes you really have to kind of um, um, really encourage a child to be involved in play with others. And sometimes it's an experiment. Sometimes the child's not quite ready for it. And so when you see that, then you say, oh, you know what, if you want to go do something else, that's fine. But it, it is important for children who don't have those social skills to learn them. And as a teacher, it's our job to do that. Um, so one of the things that when you have an inclusive classroom is that it will be obvious that some children are different than others. And it's important to talk about that. We can't just do this. Oh, we're all the same. Everybody's the same. We're all friends because it's obvious to children when a child is in a wheelchair or a child can't communicate verbally the way other children can, or he can't use his hands the way other children can. So it's, the best thing is to talk about it honestly and openly and as clearly and simply as you can and not make it a big deal. And sometimes um, kids will really um, key into specific things. So a child who has some sort of adaptive device, if a child has um, um, a, a wrist support or has some sort of, you know, some adaptive device that they're using. It's important to talk about it. And it's important 
for a child who uses an adaptive device or who has some sort of special need to feel comfortable talking about it with other children. Um, working with parents is really important in this case. So how, how do we talk about um, um, Randy's needs with the other children in the class? Is this something where you wanna come in and talk about how when Randy was born, um, you know, he couldn't use his legs the same way that you can. And so he has to wear these braces to help him learn how to walk the way you do. Um, how are you gonna encourage this? Be positive, move closer to the children, make encouraging comments, keep the play going. Don't force it, but make it work. Um, okay. So what are we talking about? We're talking about sharing and turn taking. Sometimes kids have to give up what they have to meet the needs of others. This is an important skill to learn. Um, teaching children to take care of themselves, um, giving them plenty of materials and encouraging imitation by providing two of something. So this is an important thing in an inclusive classroom. You want a typical child and uh, a child with special needs to be able to do things together. So that sometimes means you need you know, more of a thing so that you can have one child who's playing with it and then another child who's figuring out how to play with it. One of the reasons why we include, we, we provide inclusive behavior or inclusive classrooms is so that children can see and imitate the behavior of others, right? So you want to make sure that your children who are typical are playing with your children who have special needs. Um, because this is an important part of an inclusive classroom. And you need to encourage that. And you need to say, oh, you know what, Jerry, I know that you like to play with the cars. And I think Rebecca would really like to play with the cars with you. Can can we talk to Rebecca and see if she wants to play with us and see what cars she likes? And you know what I mean? So encouraging and supporting that play with children of all kinds, right? Um, okay, and then you have peer interactions, which is what we were talking about before. Um, we want to make sure that there you are encouraging them to work together, that you're encouraging all the students in your classroom and specifically encouraging students with special needs to work with children who are typically developing. Um, don't make it a job for typically developing students to be you know in charge of a a kid, but make it something where they can share together. Um, it's really important for all children to have opportunities to share their skills and knowledge with their peers. And that goes across the board. So you may have a child with autism who knows everything there is to know about trains or dinosaurs or whatever. And it's important that they be given opportunities to share that with other children, right? Not just that typically developing children get to share what they know with the children with disabilities, but that it goes both ways. That's really important. Um, we're talking about that again. Um, so you want to embed all of this social learning within the things that you're doing in your classroom. So it's not just now it's social learning time. Now we're going to learn about, you know, how to get along with our friends, making sure that you're doing activities, books, um, projects so that children do this sort of naturally throughout the day. Um, having buddies is super important too. And um, it's a great way for kids to kind of be really encouraged to work together. If if you say you're, you're buddies, it gives them roles that they need to fill. And we know that kids have more um, 
success in doing things when they they know that there's a structure and a role that they need to fulfill. So buddies is great. Um, making sure that everybody in the classroom has the same rules. So you need to make the rules that are going to work for everybody because you can't expect that the rules, um, you can't expect everyone to, to abide by the rules if they can't, right? So you need to make sure that the rules and expectations work for everyone and that they are um, enforced, encouraged, appropriately, and fairly. When you have a child who needs a little bit more help, right, then provide a place where they can do it with um, without a lot of distraction, right? Um, give them practice with the, the teacher before trying to engage with another child. Um, and always model and support the child. So modeling what you the behavior that you want to see, being very specific about the expectations that you have, having children have chances to practice these behaviors with other children and with teachers. These are all really important things. There you go.